Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you in God's house. Just to quickly introduce myself, for those who have not... Well, I try to shake everyone's hands. If I didn't, I apologize. <laughs> um, so, just a quick introduction. Um, I'm Jason Schaefer. Um, I've been a lay servant um, with the Mon Valley District since late 2017, or no, early 2017, late 2016. Um, I got started um, basically thanks to the guidance and mentorship of Tom Shepard. Um, but around that same time, I, I also became a member of the Methodist Church, but I've been going to Metadale H and H pretty much in my entire life because of my mom Marcia Schaefer. Um, so that's that's kind of my quick spiel, but you'll get to know me more as we all, you know, commune together with God. So my sermon that I um, this is the same ser last sermon I preached at the Metadale Charge, but it's an important sermon because this is a pretty uh, compelling realization I had um, essentially in the last three or four months. And this has kind of um, been a sort of like an epiphany that I kind of had when I started going to Cornerstone Ministries um, in the last three or four months, and I think this epiphany hit me before all this opportunity came up. And so I wanted to kind of share this realization with you because I think it's pretty important because it kind of is kind of like the foundation or cornerstone, as I <laughs> want to call it almost, for what I want my ministry to be about. So I call, I'm, I call it at God's ceaseless victory. And I got my notes all out of order. <laughs> That's not good. I should have stapled them. You'll know. And this is and this is and the funny thing is, is in my welcoming statement in the, in the top, I even talk about this. So I got up this morning, getting ready to preach to you all today, doing the same thing I do every day, although not in perfect order because of this pesky thing I got called ADHD. You know, trying to get up, remember to brush my teeth, deodorant, clothes. Uh, coffee, breakfast, well, forgot breakfast. Maybe I had a fig bar, I don't remember. But I know I made sure to have coffee because otherwise I'd be really sluggish right now. Okay, I did have a cookie. <laughs> Subway cookie in between getting here. <laughs> you know, these monotonous tasks that we all have every day when we get up for work, I mean, they, they kind of get annoying. Some people, it's like you just don't, it's like how do people put up with this stuff for 50, 60 years till they retire? I, don't, I mean, I've only been working full time for five years as a software engineer. I mean, they get exhausting, they drag on, downright frustrating. Our minds start to wonder, you know, when will this stuff end? When will the monotony of everyday life change? You know, some people feel like they're in a rut. You know, when will life finally move on? When will we get to the next step, that promotion? When we get to that next job, we're always looking to the future for that next, whatever that grand, next grand scheme we have for our life. We're always dreaming of that next thing. For some people, it might be that they're captured by depression, the anxiety of tomorrow, or even serious situations that are just too painful to bear or talked about. Some might even wonder, how could God let us suffer like this? How are we winning here? We are losing. We're falling constantly. I mean, look at all the things that we see on TV, all the things on the news networks and on the internet. Is God just not powerful or strong enough to stop all this? Have we done too much that God can't possibly see us through in this mess that we've put ourselves in? Well, of course not. This can't be true. Did we just suddenly stop believing everything that we've read in our Bibles? The God that wished the universe into existence can't be possibly so feeble he would be at the mercy of his own creation. That's just our own minds messing with us. Our own pain, our human condition, our misery blinding us to the reality. The reality that God is actually more powerful than we think. 
that we even can realize in our three-dimensional being. And that's plain for us to see in Romans. Um, And so the reading I have is in Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Um, I'm not sure what Bible you use, but I use the Good News translation. Um, So if it comes off different, I apologize. (laughs) Oh, Romans chapter 8, verses 26 through 39. Sorry, I, I sometimes when I get a little nervous, I talk very quickly too. It's very, very normal for me to do that every time I preach at a new church for the first time. I like to talk very quickly. <laughs> Okay, so in the same way, starting with 26, in the same way the Spirit helps us in our weakness, we do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. And those he predestined, he also called. Those he called, he also justified. Those he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say in response to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? It is God who justifies. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus, who died, more than that, who is raised to life, is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in all creation, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. The Word of God for God's people. Amen. One of the most powerful verses I've read recently. Romans is probably one of the greatest books in the Bible. I just, I love... I severely feel like I've severely misunderstood the book of Romans because, or Romans, because it's one of the greatest understandings. Paul is one. Paul started out as a quick tangent. Paul started out, you know, as a persecutor of Christians, and then by the end of his life, he was one of the greatest defenders of Christians you'll ever meet. First, he was a essentially, you know, a Pharisee, a legalist. A, you know, a lawyer, in a sense. 
you know, follow the rules. And by the end, all of his, all of his books or epistles that he wrote were all about him defending grace. Sure, he has a few rules in there that he talks about, and, but most of his arguments in there are all about defending the power of God's grace, and it's, it's really impressive. And I didn't totally grasp that. And to sort of go along with that, I want to talk about one of the imagery that we have so grained up in our heads, you know, Christ being on Calvary, dying for our sins. I mean, that's like our central message, right? Christ has died for our sins, but we have it so ingrained in our heads. Sometimes I think we sort of forget like how intense what Christ went through to die for us. Like, we almost, and it's none of our faults. It's, and it's not that we're intentionally taking it for granted, but it's like we almost forget God came down in human form, both fully human and fully divine, to come down and bear the weight of our sin for the glory of his kingdom. So I want to reiterate that to you. When Jesus carried that cross, that cross was meant to be representative of the entire burden of all of humanity's sin from the beginning of time to the end of time. When he was put on the cross and died for us, if you believe that he physically and or spiritually, as I do, divinely bore our sins like I do, then I would argue that in an instant when he died, he experienced and felt the physical and spiritual death that comes with the atonement required for each and every single one of these sins. He felt every suffering every person ever went through here on earth. Jesus has felt it all. He knows it all. He has witnessed it all. He came down here on earth to feel it as human. He willingly chose to do that knowing it would hurt. Now, I'm not a theologian. I'm not going to argue about how this all exactly happened. I'm just a lay servant. It's on my little pen. <laughs> I don't have a seminary. I haven't went through seminary. I don't have a degree on how exactly all that happened on Calvary. But I know and have witnessed God's love for us. Any worldly sins or suffering in a single moment you and I have have ever witnessed through the ages is paled in comparison to this. And this isn't to diminish what we have experienced, but Christ has experienced, I believe, when he was on the cross, I think he experienced all of the pain that we all witnessed all in an instance. I think he had to take on the burden of everything and witness it all. I mean, if you think about it, I think there's a reason why he had to go out into the desert for 40 days. He had to recognize the divinity that he carried. He had to go out and take on the devil for, four, for 40 days, experiencing every possible temptation, preparing himself, training to be ready for this onslaught. The grit and determination God had in this human form was superhuman. If you remember, too, he also experienced the absence of the Father and cried out, Why have you forsaken me? Some people struggle with this passage, and I did for a long time too. How could Christ say, Why have you forsaken me, Father? Some of this see as, this as a weakening of Christ, but it's not. This is not Christ faltering. He is just recognizing the humanity of himself. He too felt what it was like to miss the presence of the Spirit. Like we all feel that, that wall in our darkest moments of despair, in our, in our lowest point. It is Christ's final beautiful acknowledgement that Psalms 22, verse 1, was fulfilled as promised. Those same words, why have you forsaken me? The new covenant was sealed. We were saved. We are saved, as he promised all along. God is timeless. He has planned this all along before any of us were ever knitted in the womb. This great plan that would allow Jesus Christ to allow God's adored children 
to be reconciled with him, even though he knew long ahead, way before any of us were ever born, that we would reject him with our fiery, rebellious, independent, free-willed spirits. And believe me, I have an independent, free-willed spirit. He still died on that cross for me, and he died on that cross for you. All in a moment, without any weakening of his own spirit, only an acknowledgement of his humanity, he had won the greatest battle, the greatest war that humanity has ever witnessed. And God was already singing the, 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 the song of victory. God was singing this, this victorious song before Christ ever was on the cross because God already knew what was going to happen. He already knew that he was going to win. Poor Emery. Where do you need it? Do you need a does she need a diaper change or what? Oh, okay. Okay. Whatever you need to do. <laughs> babies will be babies. Gets it from me. <laughs> she kills me at home. She does this all the time. She just steals my heart away. I mean, it says in the Bible, too, it's like we should be like children. I mean, and it's, it's like we, we like to pretend like we're adults, but sometimes I think we're more like children than we realize. We do all this stuff as adults, and <laughs> I mean, because I, I don't know. Like I said, I don't know where she gets all this whining from. So, <laughs> yeah, my mom says she 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 gets it from me, but I have no idea what she's talking about. So. So quite simply put, God is for us, and he is infinitely powerful and cannot be defeated. And the New Life translation of Romans chapter 8, verse 37 is as follows. No, despite all of these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ, who loved us. He justifies us through the cross. Every era of condemnation bounces off of us as God shields us from the onslaught of the evil one. We can rest in Christ and know his infinite favor. The favor never stops. This doesn't mean our physical bodies won't grow weak or be broken, but spiritually we will not fail. We will never be disconnected from the kingdom of God. <clears throat> spiritually, we are saved. We can remain sure in our salvation. The sweet song of victory and the... This is what I'm talking about, about getting my notes backwards. <laughs> sweet song of victory in the heavens is playing in the very moment in nature. It is in the music of creation itself. It has started since the moment creation started. I would even say that God was singing before he even decided to create creation. God's timeless after all. He knew what was going to happen before he even created the earth. It is a glorification of God that is victory. One thing I noticed growing up is a lot of the prophetic and televangelist pastors on TV is how they would like to preach about how the end of the world is near. As if they could know when this would happen, and even if they did, as if that would change anything about how we should act today. When the Bible clearly tells us no one could know other than Christ and God himself. You know, people need to get their act together People, because the apocalypse is coming. Death is at your door. Satan is winding. The world is crumbling. The world is falling apart. Hope is lost. This is the nonsense I keep hearing. And it's no wonder people my age are already so cynical, grumpy, traumatized from all of this essentially fear-driven sowing discord 
They don't see the victory. They don't see the hope, the good news. Where is the good news? If all they know is is the fear of tomorrow. And I'm not finger pointing because I've had the same fear. I'm guilty of the same cynicism of being opinionated and grumpy and having to have tact and grace of my own behaviors. Every You'll learn that every sermon I write is because of something myself I've done. I have to work on myself as well. Whether I have to, I'm just arguing that we have to bring ourselves back to the bridge of victory that Christ built. We need to return to it. The book is the book. The Bible is a book of hope. The Bible is the New Testament is a testament of hope, of grace, of mercy. Yes, it acknowledges all of the other things of our humanity and our suffering and all these things. And yes, the Old Testament is a harsh subject, and there's so many awful things that happen in it, but that is the past. We do not have to bind ourselves to the law. Jesus Christ's grace is the future. It is our present. The New Testament, the New Covenant is here today. We are free. The victory is here and now. We are free of our sin today if we accept Christ. And that is not to say, oh, we just do whatever we want. No, we have to accept that grace and accept that sanctifying grace that changes our hearts and makes us follow Him wholeheartedly and give up the thing, the worldly things that suppress us. But it is no use to just keep hammering away every day about how, how things are getting worse because that distracts us from God. If you look at sites like humanprogress.org, you can look at statistical information, how things aren't just getting worse everywhere. It's a mixed bag, like how everything is a nuanced mixed bag. If you put in your birth year, you can look at how things have changed over time. One of the things I noticed, which was a pretty big deal for me, considering we have a baby, um, infant mortality rates improved by 25% between the year of 1996 to today of 2023. I don't know about you, but that's a pretty big deal considering Olivia had preeclampsia and high blood pressure and uh, diabetes during it and had, and had to get a C-section. The medical technology we have today, who knows what might have happened 50 years ago if I was born, we both were born 50 years ago. No idea. So that's just one of the many blessings that I can praise God for today. Now, I'm not saying that it's not a mixed bag. I can't just stick my head in the sand and not see the things that hurt today. That's not true. But we are full of abundance today that we don't realize. The amount of suffering we have deal with today is of no comparison to what the early church dealt with. And that's just further proof that history has shown time and time again that through the grinning of progress, that God sees us through every age, every conflict of time, even though kingdom, even though worldly kingdoms fall, even though states and physical churches fall, the godly church of Christ never falls. It has never fallen. That's why God has never stopped singing his, his song. One last thing I want to talk about is why do I believe this so wholeheartedly? It's a pretty bold claim. Well, I was born a skeptic. Even though I've been a Christian my entire life, it's been a wavering faith my entire life. I was born with a rational mind. I mean, I started hitting computer keyboards at like the age of two or three. Just and it wasn't me even doing anything real. I was just bashing a keyboard with my hands, <laughs> trying to play the, my dad's Super Nintendo, and I wasn't getting anywhere with it, you know, play, trying to play Donkey Kong and stuff. But I grew up, you know, asking my parents questions about God, you know, probably more questions than they wanted to deal with. <laughs> but they answered pretty well for church-going parents. They didn't give me the, well, that's just the way it is, or the I don't know, like, 
why don't you go ask your dad? <laughs> or the dad, and then dad being like, well, why didn't you ask, why don't you go ask your mom? I did ask mom. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> ping pong back and forth. Well, for the most part, they didn't do that. There was a couple times they got tired of that, and they're like, Ugh. <laughs> Well, eventually in high school, and this is kind of a dirty word for some people of faith, but I can't think of a better word. I In high school, I did start to deconstruct my faith a little bit. And by college, I would say I was spiritually a husk. You know, I couldn't rationalize away anymore the problem of evil. I couldn't justify why God would allow all the suffering in the world. Nothing was satisfactory enough. There was no way to deal with all of the skepticism in my head. The pain and hurt that I felt for all the people around me hurting, I, could, I, I would, stare, would stare at God and ask, God, why would you allow all this? Don't you see your people hurting day in, day out? So for years, I studied and studied, trying to fight back and forth. I joined Lay Servantry in 2017, thanks to Tom Shepard, and that was kind of like my lifeline in, on Christianity. And I struggled with that for a long time, and that, that helped keep me in the faith, but I never to- totally stayed 100% in trust, never. But when getting into Cornerstone Ministries a few months ago, I attended their Bible study on Romans around 6 o'clock back in May. At the end of their Bible study, because it was talking about Paul's message of grace, I cried so intensely in the car in a way I hadn't in a long time. Something had just lifted things in a way that I had never realized before. When I got home, I went into my office trying to work on my certified lay ministry studies. And then all of a sudden, this strange, and I don't know, the only way I can describe it is this strange warmth. Felt like an otherworldly hug. Not like emotional goosebumps or some common wave of emotions, like from a sad movie or a song, or, or I don't know, maybe you could say like the feeling you get from listening to a hymn which is all real, but it was something otherworldly. It was nothing crazy like Paul experienced, but it was something I could not explain. The closest thing I can explain it to is probably what John Wesley uh, dealt with, or not dealt with, but felt at Aldersgate. His strange warmth he felt after listening to the to them at Aldersgate. It was enough. Just that slight touch of the Spirit, that warmth. After 27 years, just that slight warmth. No longer the barriers of cynicism and skepticism were there. It was like the chains had just lifted. That was it. It was like, I'm like, that's it? (laughs) I was like, are you kidding me? For for a week, I was like sitting there. I'm standing there, and I'm like, "Okay, when's the skepticism coming back?" I'm like, I'm like, I was like totally convinced that, you know, I was. I kept trying to like like I normally would. I would kept trying to like hammer away back with my rationality. Kept trying to like attack it. I'm like, no, this was just my emotions, you know, convinced, you know, trying to have this feeling, you know, but something stopped me every time. There was this thing in my head that just kept telling me, "No, this was real." This was real. That was like my first, I would say, real, like, convincing moment of the presence with the divine. So I end my sermon with this. If God can even work, can work through every fiber of a stubborn skeptic's heart after 27 years, which is how old I am. <laughs> if I am tangible evidence to you today of God's never-ending victory, what does that tell you today? That He isn't done with you yet either. And you're probably much better placed spiritually than I am. And if you aren't, well, I can promise you that means you too can be saved.
that he will put up with a lot more than you think he will, because trust me, he's still putting up with me because I still have questions. It's not like all of that just magically went away. I still deal with the cynicism. I still deal with my personality. Those attributes didn't go away. They just were muted. They calmed down. I'm still me, but I'm me with the spirit. So whether you're 25, 50, 75, 90, 100 years old, and God bless you if you are, it doesn't matter. You already won on the cross. And while it is a journey over time for us, God has already finished his part of the deal. The heavy lifting is already complete. But he is here with us every step of the way to get us home. He is a lighthouse shining a light on the path before us, singing the most beautiful song of triumph about his creation, knowing how no matter what, our salvation is secured if we believe in him, he believes in us. He even believes in us if we don't believe in him. He will not relent in his promise. Our part is very small. We just have to to accept his grace. So you might ask though, hold on, Jason, how does this address all of my problems in my life? My mental health conditions, my troubles, my worries, my physical ailments, and I get it. Unfortunately, I can't take on every problem in one sermon, all of our lives around us, and apply every single thing to the Bible in a single sermon. That's why you got to stick around for the whole journey. (laughs) Following Christ isn't a sprint, it's a marathon. It's a really long marathon for your entire life. But as he says in the Bible, my yoke is light. So realize this, while you have to accept his grace and that the world can hurt to be in, that God has already won. He is a constant in the universe. There is nothing that can stop his presence. The only thing that can push him out from our hearts is ourselves. So let him in. Bask your hearts in his glory. Read his word. Put your entire life, your work, your leisure, everything. Do it on behalf of him. And you will witness what it means to see his victory celebration. So I wanted to do something a little different that you might not be used used to. Um, It's a sort of a responsive reading. Um, It's called an affirm. There, you've probably done affirmations of faith before, but I found out that there's an affirmation of faith on the reading we did today in the blue hymnal. Um, It's on page eight eighty seven. It's pretty quick and short, and I promise I'll let you guys go. It's like all the way in the back, if you guys can find it. If, if not, it's okay. It'll be on the bottom left. Everyone find it. Okay. So I will just start with the leader part, and then you guys will do the the people response. Who shall separate from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine? Or nakedness or peril or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through the one who loved us. We are sure that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. And I have a closing prayer. Almighty and all-powerful God, the song of your victory over death is never ceasing. 
Fill our hearts with this beautiful music and let us share the tune of this triumph over death with others so that we can all refocus on your redeeming glory for the rest of our days. In the splendid grace of your presence, in the name of your Son and by the warmth of the Spirit, we pray. Amen. We have a closing hymn. Are we cutting it closer? 370. Okay. Savior came from glory, gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. A victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory. Beneath the cleansing flood, I heard about his healing, of his cleansing and power healing. How he made the lame walk again, caused the boy to see. Then the cry, dear Jesus, come near my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He taught me and brought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me I knew him. And all my love is with him. He plunged me to victory. He speaks the cleansing blood. A mansion he has built for me in glory. I heard of the streets of gold on the crystal sea. The back angels singing in the old redemption story. And some sweet day I'll sing up there a song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me. With his redeeming blood, he loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the blazing flood. So as you go forth about your week, remember, God's victory is never ending. No matter what the week may seem like, no matter what the world may be showing you, God will never cease to exist. He will never end. His victory, He has already claimed it. He claimed it on the cross. He claimed it for us. He has claimed it for everyone. Remember that. Remember it as you go out this week. May God bless you.